And then, you know, since, since we are sort of physicists, let, let's first talk about using a microphone. The physics of a microphone. So I have, I have another question for you. What does a microphone measure? I'd like to hear somebody to speak up, and it's okay to speak up in this room. What, what physical property are we measuring with a microphone? Mechanical vibration. Pardon? Mechanical vibration. You see, I can't hear you. Mechanical vibration. Mechanical vibration, yeah, but that's... So are we measuring displacement? Pressure, right? There's a pressure sensor in here. Right? So as we speak, two things are happening. Two things are happening. The first is we're radiating sound, vibrations. The second is, is there's wind coming out of our mouth. And, if, and you know, in, in, in the pre-COVID times, I would ask you to put your hand in front of your mouth and say, P, and you can actually feel the wind against your hand. Now, the wind is a turbulent jet of, of air. So there's pressure fluctuations in there. We have some background noise. There's pressure fluctuations in there, right? So you want, you want to avoid that the microphone picks up the pressure fluctuations. Now, there's two things in which that happens. The microphone has a little ball at the, at the end that is a wind damper. So it, it, it basically damps the pressure fluctuations because of the wind that you're blowing into the microphone when you speak. The, the second way in which you can avoid the pressure fluctuations is that, you, that the microphone is under the jet of air that comes out of your mouth. If I hold the microphone like this and I say P, okay, well, it's not very loud now, uh, you, you hear a lot of wind noise. Okay? If you have a good microphone, a professional microphone, you can just speak into the microphone. There's not a single university or a single hotel that will give you a good microphone. You always have a crappy microphone, like this one, and if you speak into it, it will pick up the wind noise. And that is why you always want the microphone to be under the jet of air of, the, of, of wind that comes out of your mouth. So I'm holding a microphone against my chin so I can remember to keep it at the right location because if I don't do it, then my hand will drop and then the volume goes down and then it goes up again when it gets closer to my mouth. So you, you just let the, the microphone rest against your chin and it's under the jet of air that comes out of your mouth. You don't have to shout, but you still have to put in some volume. Okay, physics of microphones. Um, let's get to interferometry. Uh, so noise as a, as a uh, detecting, noise for detecting time-lapse changes. You know, I, I worked on, on, on sort of noise for, for quite a while. I thought about wh why is it? And, and I think the reason is, is that the Dutch are very stingy. And it's like we're going through the garbage cans to find something useful in there. So we're looking at the, at the noise and, we, and then we are looking like, okay, is there information we can extract from the noise? Yeah, the amplifier is drifting, I think. Um, I, I don't think it's a microphone. Let me try the other one. Okay. It's on. It's on. Okay. Well, the noise is the, it's, it's the amplifier, I think, not the microphone. Okay. Huh? You have a loud voice, so maybe you. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I also have a hearing problem, so I know how, how difficult lectures can be if, you, if the sound isn't okay. Okay, I'll just go on. You know, I've, I've had the, the, the pleasure in my work to, to work with incredible people. I put some of the names of my collaborators up there. There's, there's, there's many, many more, so I'm, I'm not doing justice to, uh, um, to everybody I've worked with. But really working with other people and especially working with graduate students has been such a, a joy in my, in my career. And I really want to encourage you also to, um, to build up your network of collaborators. Right? And that's what you're doing right now. That's why we're having these meetings. Right? And I really want to, you know, as students, I, I want you to be aware that you are now among the colleagues of the future. I'm not part of your future. You know, I'm going to be gone at some point. That's the reality. But you are still have to have the chance to work together for like decades. So, so use meetings like this to build collaborations, to build connections, because that is really one of the greatest joy of, uh, of, of, of doing science. So using noise. I want to introduce this with a, with a project that we did with, uh, with ExxonMobil. I know some of you in the academic community look down on industrial research. I notice this a lot. Uh, but there's an amazing amount of data out there in, in industry. This was a project, an industrial project. 
by the way, for those of you who are interested in ocean noise, there is ocean bottom networks of hundreds of sensors around, um, run by industry, uh, and that allows you to push your work to, to higher frequencies than you do right now. And I think if you do that, you're going to find some really interesting things. And in fact, a lot of those studies have been done already. So I really want to encourage you to not be afraid of working with industry because there's opportunities out there that you may not get in the academic community. So this was a project we did with, with ExxonMobil. Um, it was an inter interferometry project where uh, there's a heavy oil reservoir. It's indicated in pink, but heavy oil is not pink. It's black. It's pitch black. Um, there is a whole network of, of wells going into the reservoir. Um, and they do that because they inject steam into the reservoir to melt the heavy oil. And then the heavy oil becomes more fluid, and then you can, then you can produce it. As you do that, you generate micro-earthquakes. So they put in a monitoring well, um, which is the, the, the vertical red line. And the monitoring well was in, instrumented with three component sensors. And here you see noise recorded at the sensors, the top station and the bottom station. What you see is noise. But hidden in the noise are correlations. Right? You cannot see this, but the, the, the wiggles that you see in the top stations and the wiggles in the bottom stations, there are certain connections between them. And that makes perfect sense, because the noise is mostly generated by pumps and generators and other equipment running at the top of the wellhead. The waves propagate downward. So every wave that, hit the case, that hits the bottom sensor must have passed the top sensor first. So of course there are correlations in there. How do you bring out the correlation? Well, you compute a cross-correlation. It's very simple. So what you do if you compute the, the cross-correlation of the vertical sensor with respect to the bottom sensor, um, you see a clear peak arising over here. It arises at the negative time because every wave that must hit the top sensor first before it hits the bottom sensor. So that's why the, the correlation arrives at a negative time. You can do some, some filtering, it becomes more beautiful, and you can basically see the wave that propagates now from the top sensor to the bottom sensor. And in fact, you can do that for every, you can cross-correlate the waves, the noise recorded at the bottom sensor with all the sensors above it. If you do that for the vertical components, so first focus at the vertical component, you see a downward propagating wave. In this well, we know the P wave velocity. So the travel time of a P wave is indicated by the red line. So very clearly, by cross-correlating the vertical components of the motions of these sensors in the borehole, we get a downward propagating P wave. And you can do the same thing for the horizontal components, the east-west components and the north-south components. That's what you see in the middle and the lower panel. Again, you see a downward propagating wave. Um, and it propagates with a slower velocity. Those are the shear waves. So this was a sort of an early study where we could show that by cross-correlating the noise and cross-correlating different components of the noise, you can get both the P waves and the S waves from noise cross-correlations. By the way, I want to encourage you to, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. You know, interrupt me. Just don't throw things at me. It doesn't matter if I get through all my slides. That's not the point. The objective is to learn. So, so don't hesitate to ask any questions you might have. Another study which showed the same thing, and that was done slightly earlier, was by, and this is a beautiful paper by uh, Campillo and Paul, and I want to encourage you to read this paper, because it, it's sort of short and sweet. It's a beautiful paper. Um, they looked at stations in, uh, in Mexico, uh, three-component sensors, three-component seismometers. They cross-correlated, in this case, not ambient noise, but the coda waves from, from earthquakes. Um, and they looked at different correlations of the, of the uh, cross-correlations between different components of the sensors. So focused first on the left panel. So the left panel is the cross-correlation of the vertical component at one station with the vertical component at another station. And again, you see clearly a wave arriving. Um, and on the right panel, you see the theoretical response of a vertical displacement due to a vertical excitation. So you can see there also, in this case, they retrieved the surface wave. They retrieved the, you would call the, 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 the vertical components of the, of the Green's function. So the vertical displacement caused by a vertical point force acting on the Earth. You, in mathematically, you would say you get the ZZ component of the Green's function. And they also cross-correlated the vertical component with the radial component. Now you get the Rayleigh waves. 
And so there you can also see on the left that you see a nice Rayleigh wave arriving. On the right you see that cross-correlation that you would get from theoretical uh, considerations. And in the bottom panel you see the cross-correlation between the vertical component of the at one station with the transverse component of another station. There will be the cross-correlation between the Rayleigh wave and the love wave, but they're not cross-correlated, so you get zero. And that's what both the, the noise cross-correlations as the theoretical model shows. So you can get a full, mathematically you'd say you get the full green tensor from, um, from um, cross-correlating different components of, of, the, of the wave field at different stations. And then another... Another paper which, which made a big impact was, um, and this was by Nikolai Shapiro and Michel Campio, who showed that by cross-correlating the, the noise recorded at different stations, and this was the micro-seismic noise that Eleanor talked about, um, you get the surface waves and you can beautifully retrieve the surface wave dispersion from these cross-correlated waveforms. Which is not a surprise, because if the noise cross-correlations gives you the Green's function, you get a full response. And if the Earth response is dispersive, then of course also the noise cross-correlation should be dispersive. And they showed that that's indeed the case. And that really changed sort of crustal surface wave tomography, because now seismologists understood that by, by, uh, by cross-correlating noise at networks of sensors, you can get the waves that propagates between every pair of sensor. And that is, of course, the dream of a seismologist if you want to do tomography. So then you got all these papers on crystal, crystal seismology um, that was based on noise. So that was, that was a big thing that, was, that had happened in the community. So um, I'm go now I'm going to do something at the, at the request of Celine. I'm going to show a derivation. I usually don't show derivations in my talks because they, they tend to be sort of boring. But Celine asked me, they said, no, no, we need, we need to do some of the foundations of, of interferometry. You know, where does the theory come from? And I had to pick. I had to pick because there's many different derivations of deriving, um, if, if you cross-correlate noise at different sensors, that you get the Green's function, that you get the response of the waves that propagate between these sensors. There is a derivation based on normal modes. There is a derivation based on noise sources that are located at the surface surrounding your receivers. There is a derivation based on what I call the raindrop model, where you basically have noise sources everywhere in your volume. And there is a derivation where you get uh, sort of plane waves coming in um, with uncorrelated noise. So I had to pick one of these four. And I thought, okay, let's pick the normal mode derivation, because in the seismological community, that was the first derivation that had a big impact. And this is work done by uh, Lopkis and Weaver. Uh, and, and I think the reason why they had such a big impact is that seismologists understood normal modes. They understood normal mode summations. I mean, they got it. And that's the, the language that they've used in their derivation for interferometry. But I want to point out that the history of interferometry goes back to 1906. If you read the paper of Albert Einstein on Brownian motion, he shows that if you know how a particle diffuses under Brownian motion, you know the viscosity of a gas. Which really, and if you know the viscosity of a gas, you know how, if, if you kick an air particle, uh, how it is being slowed down by the ambient air. That's the Green's function. You get the impulse response. So really, the whole, the whole core of interferometry is already in the, hidden in that paper of 1906 of Albert Einstein. And I want to encourage you to read that paper. By the way, that's the paper he got a Nobel Prize for, not for the theory of relativity. And then there was Nyquist in 1928. He showed that if you take a resistor at a finite temperature and you measure the, the, the voltage across the resistor, you, get, you, you measure noise, basically. It's called thermal noise. And he also showed that once you know that thermal noise you know the resistance of that, of that resistor. You know the response of that resistor when you load it with a current. Again, interferometry. In the 1950s, the, fifth, the, the quantum community discovered the whole concept of interferometry. There's a whole flurry of papers in the 1950s. And then later there were papers on what is called the fluctuation response theorem, 
just general proof for systems that if you know, for linear systems, if you know the noise characteristics of a system, you know the Green's function of the system. You know the impulse response of the system. So we were late. Right? I mean, we were basically more than a century late in the seismological community to figure it out. But it's been very profound in, um, in, in changing seismology. Okay, so I'm going to do the, 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 the noise... I'm sorry, yeah, the, the interferometry derivation from normal modes. And this is from the paper of Lopkes and Weaver. So let's start over here. Here I have the Green's function of a system that has modes, like the Earth. So what do we get? Well, we get a sum over all the modes. Okay, no surprise, the response is given by the sum over all the modes. Then there are the, the modes of the system enter twice in this equation. They enter at the excitation points and they enter at the observation points. So that sort of makes sense, because if I, if the, if, if I excite a system at a certain location, if I, if I excite a mode at a certain location, the stronger the mode is at that location, the stronger the response is. Right? If you take a guitar, and I'm not a, I'm not a guitar player, but I hope tomorrow in, in, in Nobu's session we can, we can do this, right? If you take a guitar and you pluck the guitar string in the middle, you get a nice smooth sound. That's because you mostly excite the fundamental mode of that string. Whereas if you pluck a guitar string near the end point, you get a more metallic sound. That is because the fundamental mode goes to zero near the end of the string, and the higher modes have a much larger amplitude near the end of the string. And so you excite more higher frequencies, and your ear and your brain interpret that as a more metallic sound. So the sound that you make in a musical instrument depends on where you excite it. And the same is true for the earth. The response that we get depends on where we excite the earth. So that is the, the contribution of this, of this normal mode over here. And then you get a normal mode over here, which says basically the response that you get depends on the amplitude of the normal mode. Yeah, if the normal mode is zero at the place where I have a sensor, that mode does not contribute. So that, is, that, that explains these two eigenfunctions over here. Then, of course, we get a sign over here that tells you that the normal mode starts fluctuating with time, with the frequency of that normal mode. We get a heavy side function, which basically is equal to 1 for positive times. It's equal to 0 for negative times. Yes, because the response only occurs after I have excited the medium. And then we get the 1 over omega term, which is sort of... I, I cannot explain in a simple way. But one of the first things we're going to do is get rid of that 1 over omega term. So this is the Green's function, the impulse response. At the top, we have the wave field as it is being um, also given by a sum of normal modes. So again, the wave field of the Earth, I should use the pointer, it depends on the, on the mode itself. I get a sum over normal modes. The response at a certain location depends on how large that mode is at my observation point, of course. Then I get oscillations, which contain a sine term and a cosine term. No surprise here. And again, we get the 1 over omega term. So that, that would be my noise wave field, where now the modal coefficients a and b are random numbers that are excited by ocean waves, anything else that excites the normal mode. So, first I'm going to get rid of the 1 over omega. That's very simple. We just take a time derivative. So we take these two equations, we take a time derivative, and the 1 over omega disappears. So instead of the displacement, we now measure velocity. And the Green's function that we're getting is the velocity Green's function, not the, not the displacement Green's function. Okay, so now we're gonna, we're gonna get some, bring some randomness in the model. By assuming that in our noise wave field, these coefficients that, that describe the excitation of the modes, they're random numbers, they're being generated by just ambient noise. And we're gonna assume that the excitation of the different modes is zero when the modes are different. So different modes are, the excitation of different modes are uncorrelated, that's what this delta function describes. Of course, we, there's a certain constant that describes how strongly the modes are excited, of course. We assume the same for the, the coefficients of the of the sine term over here. And we also assume that the coefficients of the cosine term and the sine term are uncorrelated. So basically what we are saying is every mode is uncorrelated with another mode. 
or the excitation of every mode is uncorrelated with the excitation of any other mode. That's what we're saying here. And every mode is excited with the same strength. That is called equipartition. The energy is distributed evenly among all the modes. Okay? Does this make sense? Any, any questions? No questions? Cheers is shaking no. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, good. There's a question there. Yes, okay. For the Earth, this is an illusion. And I'll explain that to you in a second. So I'll, I'll come back to your question, because for the Earth, not all the modes are excited in the same way. And that is affecting the practice of interferometry. So can I come back to your question at the end of the derivation? Because this is a great question. I love it. Because mathematically, this is true. But this is an illusion when it comes to real Earth, and I'll explain to you why. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, so the question is here, I have, at the top equation, I just have my, my noise wave field as a super, superposition of modes, right? In the Green's function, we get, of course, there, there, there's, there's two positions in there. There is the, the position of the excitation, and there is the position of the observation. So we, we, we will connect these two in a minute. Yes. So bear with me. But thank you for asking. Um, okay, now let, let's compute correlations. And this is related to Heiner's questions, right? In, in the, the noise wave field itself, there's only one position. But if we cross-correlate, we, we bring in the other position because I can cross-correlate my, my wave field at location A and my wave field at location B. And I can compute the cross-correlation between the noise wave field recorded at two different sensors. So now we bring in that second position that we need to make a connection with the Green's function. So you were a great sidekick, uh, Heiner. Um, okay, and I can do that. I can do that, of course. For this is the this is the, the cross correlation. I can do that. I can now take the velocity field at these two sensors, and I can express it again in that expression that I had before of the sum over normal modes. So now we compute that cross correlation, and every it gets a bit messy now. I. I Usually when you do math, by the way, you first create a mess and then you clean it up again. Right? So that's what we're going to do too. So you cross-correlate these wave fields. Every term here, these wave fields consist of a cosine term and a sine term, and I multiply them, so I get four terms. Cosine, 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 sine, sine, cosine, sine, sine. And then again, I get these, these, these expectation values of these modal excitation coefficients. So now it looks like we've created a big mess, but we're going to clean up the mess because we assume that the cross term of these different modes that oscillate like a sine and a cosine, the cross terms are, they vanish. And we also assumed that the cross terms of the cosine cosine terms, of, of the an and am terms, they were zero when the modes are different. The modes are excited in uncorrelated ways. So we only get a contribution when n is equal to m, and that's given by this delta function here. The same holds true here. So now everything becomes simpler because these terms disappear, they're equal to zero. And if I take these terms together, that is just equal to cosine omega m times t. Now we're almost done. We're almost done. So now you find that the cross correlation of these two wave fields consists of the modes at one point, at one sensor, times the mode at the other sensor, times the cosine of the frequency of that mode times the lag time tau that I've used in the cross-correlation. So that's what we have found now. And let's compare that with the Green's function, which I've shown you earlier. Again, we get a sum over modes, the mode at the observation point, the mode at the excitation point, the cosine of, with the frequency of every mode times the heavy side function. They're the same. They're the same. So now we see that if we cross-correlate cross the noise field at different sensors, 
you get the Green's function, at least for positive times. Because for positive times, this heavy side function is equal to one. So that's it. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not terribly complicated. Um, and I want to encourage you to do the math for yourself because I, I can only internalize things when I've done it myself. I usually don't internalize it by listening to somebody. That's why I normally don't do this. Um, so now I want to co come back to your question about, okay, is, is this a realistic model for the Earth? Specifically, if you look at the excitation of the normal modes of the Earth, are all the modes excited in the same way? And the answer is no, of course not. You know, if, I, if I jump up and down, I excite normal modes of the Earth, if you believe it or not. I do. But I mostly excite the fundamental mode Rayleigh waves. Right? Don't think that I excite the, the modes in the core of the Earth by just jumping up and down. That's not going to happen. And what we typically see, if you look at normal mode spectra, you will find that the fundamental mode is the most strongly excited mode. The fundamental Rayleigh wave mode is the most strong, strongly excited mode. Which is both a blessing and a curse. Why is it a blessing? Well, it means that if you cross-correlate noise recorded at, at two different sensors, you mostly get a fundamental mode Rayleigh wave. So you know what you have. So now you can use that fundamental mode Rayleigh wave for inversion procedures. And there's all these papers from the sort of 2005-2010 era on doing surface wave tomography using cross-correlations of noise. In all of these papers, the question is, isn't even posed, why do we get a fundamental mode surface wave? They just take those extracted Green's function, they do a dispersion analysis, and they do beautiful crustal tomography. In that sense, it's a blessing. Why is it a curse? Well, because interferom we've had a very hard time with noise interferometry to get information about the deep Earth. The body waves, which correspond to superposition of higher modes, are very difficult to extract from, from noise interferometry. You can do it, there's papers around, but you have to do all sorts of tricks to make it happen. Uh, you know, use arrays and stack over arrays and things like that. Uh, in, in general, our attempts to get body waves from seismic interferometry has been very, very difficult, except when you have downhole sensors, like in the first example that I showed you. And that is, so I want to come back to your question, that model of equipartitioning for the Earth is an illusion. You know, the, the, the excitation of noise in the Earth happens mostly at the Earth's surface, and therefore it excites mostly the fundamental surface wave modes. And, and sort of the body waves are not excited very strongly. Um, and that is why interferometry has been very successful in giving us information about the, the, crust, the crust. It's not been so successful in telling us, for example, what the structure of the core is, which really is too bad. Any questions about this? By? Ah, yeah. So, so the question is, can we get rid of the, that, that restriction also by measuring uh, yeah. the modes? Yeah, I, you know, I, I love that suggestion. I think if you, if, you, if you had a dense array of sensors over the Earth, you could decompose the observed wave field into the modes and use that as a way to filter. But of course, that assumes that you have sensors all over the surface of the Earth, which we don't. So, but I love your thinking. Yeah, I think it's a great suggestion. Any other questions? Okay, let's go to some, uh, let's look at some wiggles. And predictably, I'm gonna, we are gonna run out of time. Uh, so I'm gonna choose what I'm gonna show. The whole, the whole business of seismic interferometry got a real boost by Seismology is starting to use arrays. And it's sort of fortuitous that the, the growth of, sense of seismic interferometry in seismology, which was in the 2000s, coincided with the deployment of very dense arrays. Um, here you see on the left, you see sensors of US array, which was sort of an array that was rolling through the United States. Um, and this is a study done by Fang Shi Lin. 
um, where he took the, the, just the ambient noise recorded at, at one station, which is indicated by an asterisk here, with, here, with the noise recorded at all the other stations. And that cross-correlation is shown here for a lag time of 100 seconds on the left and 200 seconds on the right. And this shows you that you can beautifully see the surface wave propagating through the array. It really is like this, this master station over here that was used in the cross-correlation acts as a source, and we call it a virtual source. It's not a real source, of course, because there is no physical source there. There's just a sensor recording the noise. But it acts as a point source that sends circular waves through the array. So this, this example shows you the power of, of just seismic interferometry, because now you can find the cross-correlations with this master station gives you the waves from each of these stations in the array to this master station. Um, and of course, you can do that for every station in turn. You can use it as a master station. So you can get an incredible coverage um, of, 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 of uh, measurements of wave propagation through this area, which is, of course, the dream for everybody who wants to do seismology. Uh, tomography, I'm sorry. But one of the beautiful aspects of noise interferometry is that the noise is always present. The noise is always present. And that allows us to do time-lapse monitoring with, with seismic interferometry. And, you know, if I look at the program, we're going to see incredible examples of it. Um, there's just one example I want to show, and this is by Eric Lerose and uh, Christoph van Schoenfelder was involved, and maybe all others too. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not doing credit to everybody. Um, so there's an array over here. Stations are just a few tens of meters apart. Uh, you can put the cross-correlation of the noise between these stations. You see a beautiful surface wave that propagates from station 4 to station 3, and you get a beautiful surface wave that propagates from station 3 to station 4. Uh, again, you can do dispersion analysis. You can get, you can get a model for the, for the near surface. In this case, the shallow near surface. But the beauty about... This study is that is, this was done on the moon. This was, this was noise recorded on the moon using one of the, using the arrays of seismometers that were placed there during the Apollo mission. Um, and it's pretty amazing that, that one of the very early papers of seism seismic interferometry used noise recorded on the moon. This is an absolutely gorgeous paper, and I want to encourage you to, to read this. But because the noise is there all the time, you can also measure how does the velocity change over time. And um, so here time runs from the left to the right. We go from September here to April over here. Um, the velocity at, on every day is indicated here with a dot. And the red line gives sort of, sort of a moving average. And you see a clear cycle there in the, the seismic velocity in the moon as a function over time. In fact, you see a clear periodicity here with a period of about one month. Um, why one month? Christoph knows, knows the answer, of course. Why, why, would, why would the seismic velocity on the moon change with a period of about four weeks? Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, it's the rotation of the moon. In fact, it's not, it's not so much the rotation of the moon around the Earth, but it's the rotation velocity of the moon itself. So, so it takes a month or basically 28 days for the, for, the, for the moon to rotate. And that is the same, by the way, as the rotational velocity of the moon around the Earth because of tidal deceleration, those, those rotation rates are the same. Um, so... We can beautifully see the day-night rhythm of the seismic velocity on the moon. Now here we see negative, negative to relative velocity change. So we, we can see, and, and the, the lunar uh, night is indicated in, in black, the lunar day is indicated in, in, in white. So we can see during the lunar day, um, the velocity goes down. It goes up in the curve, but it really goes down. This is my only criticism on this paper. Christoph, why the minus sign? It confuses everything. But it's, it's a gorgeous study. During the lunar day, the velocity goes down. That's because the, the soil heats up. And uh, if you increase the temperature, it becomes less stiff. And so the velocity goes down. Heino.
Okay, so here you see the frequency range of the noise, right? This, this, this is two seconds. Here you see the cross correlation, but the frequency range of the cross correlations is the same as, um, um, as of the ori original measurements. So, yeah, so it's a 10 ish hertz, yeah, 5, 10 hertz, something like that. What generates the noise? Christoph, you want to answer that question? Yeah. So for it's, it's crackling noise when the, when the, when the, the, the generated by the temperature variation, but there's also I, I guess there's also meteorites. But I, 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 my guess is it's not really known what the relative contributions of the two is. Yeah, so, so the, the comment of Philippe is that meteorites, they will, they, will, they will excite waves. And the attenuation of waves on the moon is very, very low compared to the Earth. That's because the moon is much older, it's much colder, lower temperature, which means uh, smaller attenuation. So, so relative to, to, um, to the Earth, the moon keeps on reverberating for a long time after you have excited it. This is your place, Ludovic. You, you don't want to study Earth, you want to study Moon. Because you get, you get very strong coda waves. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. No, you ask a great question. Why, 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 don't, why don't we see that in the correlation? You know, th this is a great question. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure, I don't think I quite know the answer. The noise cross correlations have done a spectacular job in, in extracting the fundamental mode Rayleigh waves that propagate between two sensors. They've not done a spectacular job in generating the coda waves for reasons that I don't quite understand. So what, 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 what we typically see, if we, if we look at, at noise cross correlations between sensors, um, we, we beautifully get the fundamental mode Rayleigh wave. We do, a, we do a pretty poor job in explaining the coda waves. And we know the coda waves because we can also do active, active source measurements to find out how strong the scattered waves are. And I don't quite know why that would be the case. My, my, my guess is that, and I, I come at it now from a mathematical point of view, that stationary phase tends to favor the direct waves that propagate between sensors. But I don't, I don't, I, did, I think it's still an open research question. And it's a question that we are ignoring in the seismological community because it's an uncomfortable question. So students, there's a project here for you, right? Go, go for it, yes. I'm, I'm, can you maybe lower your mask for the... Okay, so you're saying you are retrieving the coda waves from noise cross correlations? Yes. Okay, well, I'd love to talk to you. Yeah. Um, now, it may be, of course, coming back to Heiner's question, that there is, there, there is low attenuation, but there, is no, there isn't strong scattering on the moon for these distances and these periods. I, I guess that's part of the answer to, to, to your question. And of course, we, 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 we don't get a surface wave that have propagated all around the moon and, and, and have come back to the sensors because we don't have waves that come in for such long lag times, right? This is a lag time of a few seconds. I don't know. You know, by the way, th those are words that we shouldn't be afraid to speak. We always present our research as if we know everything. Because we look weak if we say, I don't know, and reviewers may attack us. But I think good research generates more questions. 
And we shouldn't be hesitate to say, okay, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. But, but, but the, the, the system of publishing does not encourage that. And so I, but I want to really encourage you to also to talk about, especially in meetings like this, what is it that we don't know? What are the open research questions? Because that is what drives the research for tomorrow. Okay, I'm looking at the time. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna skip a lot of slides, that's okay. Um, I wanna show you some examples of, of, of interferometry um, from the work of Nori Nakata. He did, a, he did a PhD with me and it was an incredible privilege to work with, uh, with Nori. Um, and I'm gonna show it to you first of all because he got really interesting results on time-lapse changes. But the other thing I want to get across is that um, most of us in the in sort of the interferometry community compute cross correlations, but there's real advantages of, of computing deconvolutions instead of cross correlations. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of it. And I want to encourage you to also play around with deconvolutions in addition to cross correlations because they can be much more robust and specifically they can give you a much higher resolution in time which is really important if you want to look at, at, at time-lapse changes in, in, in systems. So, um, Nori did not work with ambient noise. He worked with, um, with just earthquake records that were recorded in KickNet. So in Japan, there is a, a very large array with about 900 stations, it's called KickNet, and at every station there's a borehole, and the borehole is instrumented. So you can get measurements of the wave field at the, at the Earth's surface and also at a depth somewhere between 200 and 400 meters because the, the, the bottom sensors are at different depths in the different boreholes. And here you see the waveforms recorded after an earthquake uh, at one of, the, one of the kicknet stations. So it's not ambient noise. Um, I mean, you can see it here. This is earthquake data because the ambient noise is what you can see before the P wave arrival. So what we mostly get is just very complicated waves that are incident on the stations. Why are the waves complicated? Well, because there's a lot of scattering in the crust of the Earth, there's a lot of scattering under the, under the sensors, which complicates the waveforms. So the waveforms look very noisy. Now, if you cross-correlate here, this is for one particular station, if you cross-correlate the waveforms recorded at a borehole sensor, with the waveform recorded at the top sensor, similarly to what I showed in the first example of Masatoshi Miyazawa, um, you don't get very consistent results if you look at different, different earthquakes. You see a peak over here, but you know, it, it doesn't really stand out. So this is what cross-correlation gives you. If instead of cross-correlation you use deconvolution, this is what we get. And we, we can see that we get a very nice consistent consistent peak uh, at a given travel time. Um, so this indicates that, at least for these data, deconvolution gives you much more consistent results than, than cross-correlation. And by the way, doing a deconvolution is as complicated as doing a correlation. Right? If you know how to do a Fourier transform, you can do both. I mean, I can do this. And I'm really clumsy with computers. Um, so why does deconvolution work so much better here than cross-correlation? And the answer is not very complicated. Um, here I have the wave field that propagates through my array. It propagates in a near vertical direction because all the rays, uh, they, they turn towards the surface because the velocity at the surface is so, is so slow. So the waves, they, they turn towards the surface. So we assume that the waves propagate in the vertical direction only. So what do I get? Well, I get a phase shift because the wave propagates in the vertical direction. And then there is some function which depends on frequency, which characterizes the noise wave field that is incident on the array. This is a very complicated function that we don't know and that we don't want to know. We want to know this wave propagation term. That's the objective. Okay, so if you compute the cross correlation in the frequency domain, you just take the, the spectrum of the wave field at the surface and you multiply it with the complex conjugate of the spectrum of the wave field at your, at your borehole sensor. And if you do that, you take this expression, you evaluate it as z is equal to zero and z is equal to d. You get this propagation term. Good, that's what we like. And we get this, you get the power spectrum of the noise. Now don't be fooled here. You might think like, 
well, this is just a positive constant. But it's not. It's positive, but it's not a constant. Because this function has peaks for certain frequencies, it may have zeros close to other frequencies. This can be a very complicated function. And because for different earthquakes, this power spectrum is different, if you compute a cross-correlation for these different earthquakes, like I just showed you, you get a different answer. Now, if instead of convolution, correlation, you do a deconvolution, so you divide the spectrum of the wave fields at the surface with the spectrum of the wave fields at depth, then this S of omega term drops out. It goes away. Problem solved. And you find that the deconvolution only depends on the propagation of the waves between these two sensors, and it doesn't depend at all on the, on the characteristics of the noise wave field. Yeah, Geert. Uh, that sounds very great. Are there also downsides of using the deconvolution? Yes, thank you for being my sidekick. There is a downside. Yes, that's the next slide. Yes. So, there is a downside. Okay, this was the good news, right? Now the bad news. The bad news is, is that... Uh, okay, here again, it's the same story, right? If I, if I have one noise source, right, the wave field at location A is the Green's function from the noise source to location A times the noise wave field. If I do the deconvolution, the noise wave field goes away. Okay? What if I have two noise sources, meaning there's waves coming in from different directions, so not only a, a vertically propagating wave, but there might also be, for example, a Rayleigh wave propagating through my array. And now you can see it falls apart, because now the wave field at each sensor consists of a contribution of these two, two noise sources. If you go through the whole thing, you do the deconvolution, the, the S terms, which characterizes the noise, doesn't drop out anymore, because there's an S1 and an S2. So the deconvolution interferometry typically works when I have noise coming in from one direction only. But for one-dimensional systems, this works really well. You know, there's, I've, I've done a study in a building, analyzing the vibrations in the building in this way. It's essentially one-dimensional wave propagation. It works great. I mean, deconvolution interferometry does, gives me incredible results. Correlation interferometry gives me crap. Same thing might happen with bridges and other structures where the wave propagation through every structural element is essentially one-dimensional. Great question. Thank you, Thierry. Okay, I just want to show you some result of, ta of time-lapse changes. Here again, I, I show you these, these, these wave fields in retrieved from deconvolution. Um, since the, the structure at each of these wells at KickNet is known, we can compute the propagation velocity of a shear wave that is indicated by the red line, and you can see that you beautifully extract the shear wave that propagates between these two sensors. And the reason why this was such a beautiful study is that KickNet has like 900 stations and has been operating for years and years, so this was a, sort of a data mining gold mine. So we ask ourselves, okay, we can do this for each of these 900 stations, we can do this over a period of about 10 years, um, what information is in there? Um, so here you see maps that, that Nori made of the shear wave velocity in the near surface. Uh, when he averaged over earthquakes in different years, 2000, 2002, 2010. Um, and he also computed that shear wave velocity from the logging data that had been taken at every well. You can see a beautiful agreement here. But of course, the interesting question is, are there, are there patterns in here? Specifically, are there temporal patterns in here? And the answer is yes, there are. So, here you see the velocity change after, after, that occurred after earthquakes. And this was done for earthquakes in the Niigata prefecture, which is in the western part of Japan. So, every block, every pair of blocks gives us the average shear wave velocity change after major earthquakes occurred in here. And because there are so many stations, we could do statistics. We could find out, are these changes significant or are they not significant? So that is why these boxes, they indicate standard deviations. And you can see here, after three earthquakes, um, the shear velocity dropped. And this has been shown many, many times. It, in, in fact, it was shown much earlier uh, for the San Andreas fault. Name escapes me now. 
the beautiful paper in science. You all know it. Pardon? Pardon? Yeah, Bring yeah, Brengier, right? Florent Brengier. That that was a beautiful paper, and there have been many many papers since on detecting changes uh, recorded after earthquakes. But I want to show you another example of um, time lapse changes and and the 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 importance of doing deconvolution interferometry. So then the Tohoku earthquake happened, right? Big big shaking all over Japan. Um, here you see these deconvolved waveforms for the station in Fukushima, close to the nuclear power plant. And the earthquakes, bef the cross correlations before the earthquakes are given by the black lines, the cross correlations after the earthquakes are given by the blue lines, and the magenta line gives us the cross correlation during the shaking of the Tohoku earthquake. Um, and you can clearly see that the velocity again dropped after the earthquakes. That's not a, that's not a big surprise. Um, we know that now. But I want to focus in particularly on what happens during the main shock of the, to of the Tohoku earthquake. So here what Nori did is he took, he took the, the recordings of the, of the waves in the borehole um, during the main shock of the Tohoku earthquake. He divided it up into periods, into time windows of about 20 seconds. So every vertical line here gives you a time window. So let's look at this time window here, for example. Right. So he took the waveforms recorded at the surface and the waveforms recorded at the bottom sensors. He deconvolved them, and that, that deconvolved waveform is shown over here. So he did it for all of these different time windows. Right. And what you see here is that the travel time increases as the shaking during the Tohoku earthquake increases, and it decreases again when the shaking subsides. That means that the, that the velocity of in the near surface went down as the earth was being shaken by the Tohoku earthquake, and then as the shaking subsided, the velocity recovered again. So the reason I show you this is that this is an almost real-time measurement of the velocity change as the earth is being shaken. This could be done because we use deconvolutions. If you do cross correlations, you get crap, because the time windows are too short to give you reliable cross correlations. Or those cross correlations are really contaminated by the power spectrum of the noise, of, of the shaking in the time window. But deconvolution interferometry does, does beautifully. Now I see all, all the hands go up. I think you're going to throw things at me probably, but let's take students first. And, and Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this is a great question. So your, your question is, and, and I whether, um, because the ground motion is so strong, whether there is, that may affect the response. And, and I love that question because I, I worry about this. And, and this is my concern. If the ground motion becomes stronger and stronger, at one point the instrumentation may come become non-linear. Okay. And the non-linearity may be different at the surface sensor than the bottom sensor. It probably is non-linear at the surface sensor than the bottom sensor because the displacement at the surface sensor is larger than it is at the bottom sensor. And so non-linearity might, uh, might cause the response of these sensors, the bottom sensor and the top sensor, to change in different ways. And, and that could that would affect your deconvolved waveforms. By the way, it would also, it would also affect the correlated waveforms. It, it's the same, if the same problem. And I've worried about it, and, I, and I've talked to a lot of people who know about instruments. I don't, you know, I mean, for me, they are black boxes that give me, give me wiggles. They all tell me, no, for these, for these accelerations, you don't need to worry about it. But I'm not completely at, at ease, you know. I would love it to have to, to do a test with these sensors, put them on a shake table, and find out the degree to which these responds, these instruments still respond in a linear way. It's a great question. And I don't know if you covered this last week, but this is, I think, an open question. By the way, I've also done similar studies in, in buildings, and we also find that, that as buildings are swaying during earthquakes, the apparent shear velocity of the building goes down as well and recovers again. And I'm and I worried about your, your concern. 
But the, the, the instrument buffs tell me, no, for these accelerations you don't need to worry about this yet. But great question. Let's take student questions, students questions first. Heiner, I love your questions, but um, so, I'm sorry, what was your name? René. René. Fire away. Are you asking the, the, the process what's happening here? Yeah. 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 Well, okay. So the, the travel time increases, which means that the shear velocity decreases. The, I think there's different mechanisms that, 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 that contribute to it. One is that if you have uh, pre-existing cracks, which you always have, and you, now you start deforming your medium by the waves, you may, you may open up more cracks that would decrease the shear velocity. What might also happen is that because of the, the shaking, you get a little bit of compaction. Right? If, you, if, if you take, let's say, a box of sand and you, shake, you tap it slightly, it may compact a little. If there is fluids trapped between the grains, then the pore pressure increases. That pushes back against the grains and that, and that softens the shear contacts between the grains. And, and this can be so severe that the, the soil may actually liquefy. Right? And, and this is what you saw during the Tohoku earthquake. You know, there was a lot of liquefaction. It basically turns into blubber. By the way, I want, I want you to, if you go to the beach, and I hope you'll go to the beach this week, I'd like you to do two things. First of all, if you, if you put your foot on the sand, you'll see that the sand becomes dry around your feet. So what happens is that you deform the sand a little bit in a way that the pore space increases, and that'll make the, the water table go down, and then the surface of the sand becomes becomes dry. You can do this. But if you tap the sand with your feet like this, you'll see that it, it starts to liquefy. So there you are perturbing the sand in a continued way so that the sand actually compacts and then the pore pressure increases to the degree that the sand turns into a liquid. I mean, please go to the beach and, and do this. It's a lot of fun. Let me see. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, Tarje, but students go first. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. What is shown before for the Tohoku was that there is a constant also, right? And this is yes, yes, yeah. I love it. Yeah, so the, so the question is what, what we see here is a recovery. You see that actually as the shaking subsides, let's say 150 seconds and larger, um, that there is a recovery. Um, but we don't know yet if it recovers to the same value as it does over here. And our measurements taking over longer time intervals show that it doesn't quite recover to the, to the original value. And so there is the whole issue of healing of the subsurface as it is being perturbed. And I, I have a whole talk about that, but I will not talk about this. But I, I presume we're going to hear more about this in, 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 this, uh, in this session. That um, you know, earth materials heal just like your skin does. You cut your skin and you get fibers growing between... The, the, the cut skin, um, and then finally the, the, the skin heals. The same happens in the earth. And there's, there's, uh, there's beautiful SEM images of Tiziana Vanoria at Stanford who show that actually, uh, she looked at fractures, and there's actually sort of sprites, little, little, little sticks of minerals that are growing between the two sides of the fractures as a, as a first step towards, towards healing. Very similar to what happens in our bodies. So earth materials heal. Uh, I think this is a fascinating research topic. And I, I will not get, get into it now. Uh, Christoph and I wrote some papers about healing of earth materials. And there, there is a lot we don't know about this. In fact, Christoph always tells me, he says, you know, we, we never measure the, the unhealed earth. Earth is continuously being perturbed. And we never find the, 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 the seismic velocities that we would get if we would leave Earth alone and give it the time to heal, because we never leave it alone. Did I capture that correctly? No. Okay, good. <laughs>